Um, we're going to try and get started and keep uh, this session on time. So um, if you were here in the last session, and really the whole theme of this whole conference has been about learning from others and acknowledging that uh, here in Australia and on Great Barrier Reef, we are sort of uh, a little bit behind and we are really keen to learn from the experience of others. And that's what this session is really about. Um, and if you saw Adam's talk in the last session, he highlighted some of the uh, pioneers and the, the giants whose shoulders we're standing on. Uh, and we're re really lucky to have a lot of those uh, uh, people represented in that talk actually presenting in this session. Um, and it, it's also really exciting that this uh, session is being live streamed. So we have a, a bunch of international guests who are watching this live stream right now, I think. So welcome to those as well. And thanks to everyone who's come, not just from around Australia, but from around the world. And um, we really appreciate that. Um, and I'll just get going straight away. And we are starting um, with uh, Austin Bowden Kirby, who is one of those early pioneers with 30 years of, of experience in this field. Um, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I have a handout that Austin and, and your name? Uh, Louise, okay, Louise have. And uh, this handout is not for everybody. It is only please for those who are actively involved in coral restoration, okay? And one per group, please. Because, and if you don't get one and you need one, I'll, I have an electronic copy and, or I'll email it to you, right? You have my email address. So that's all of the lessons learned that I don't have time to talk about here. Um, and maybe each one of those is a thesis topic for somebody if, if they're interested. And we need to, it's time now to start sharing our knowledge most of our learning is not published. So the people we've been talking about analyzing things, most of learning is simply not published. And, um, but anyway, I'm here today and my talk is gonna be a little bit weird. I'm not giving a scientific talk really today. I'm talking to your heart. Okay, this is me and my family. Um, I first lived in the Pacific when, from I was 11 years old. And uh, I snorkeled on a coral reef, and I was transformed by that experience. And the beauty, you know, it's transformational, and you know it. And so I lived in the Pacific. I got married to another American that I knew for many years, and we had four children. This picture is in Palau, where we were teaching at a school. Um, and we lived in Chuuk, Palau, Ponape, Guam, Saipan. We lived around the Pacific. And now we live in Fiji. And uh, building a life and, 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 and making connections with local people and seeing the needs. The future is in our hands. This is my grandson, Kiki, who's uh, my Fiji, one of my Fijian grandchildren. And um, I just want to say that thank you. Thank each one of you for being part of the future and for trying to secure the reefs. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a strange story I never would have imagined telling it in a conference like this. But in the 1970s, when I was a young marine biologist, I, nobody had heard of bleaching, coral, mass coral bleaching, what was that? You know, I had seen one or two white corals killed by crown of thorns, but, but massive bleaching I didn't, ha didn't hear about. And one, one night, I had a dream in 1978 when I was in Fiji, and I dreamed that I was standing on the shore and all the corals had turned white in the ocean, bright white. And I jumped in the sea and I could breathe the water and I saw a light coming from the bottom of the ocean from these beautiful white corals. And I went down and it was funny, it was an Elkhorn coral that I saw. So <laughs> the bright light was coming out and I swam down and I got close and I could see that among the corals, skeletons, the white skeletons, were the white bones of people. The coral skeletons, the white corals, and the white bones were intermingled. And I had no idea what that meant. And now I see that the fate of the planet is right here in this room. That this is important. If the coral reef really dies in the next 200 years, it might take that long to kill it, but if it dies, humanity is going to die, and we deserve it, okay? But so, so this, is, this is kind of strange. 
And the solution will not be the scientists. Yeah, we need scientists, but the solution will be people of good heart, people who work hard, people who are dedicated, people who love. Love is the answer and dedication. So don't think that, it, and it's the pride of scientists and the pride of government officials that are slowing us down right now. So we have to shed our pride and we have to work together. Okay, so remember the idea, one person can go much faster by himself if you have a journey, but if you take, if you wanna go along, so if you wanna go fast, go by yourself. If you wanna go a long distance, go together. So let's go together. I am here, I would be willing to help anybody who needs help. That's what I do, mostly for free. <laughs> okay. okay, my story, I better hurry up. Okay, in Micronesia, I give a talk, I have a TED talk that has some of these slides, okay. In Micronesia in the 70s, children were going blind and they were dying from lack of protein because of dynamite fishing. And I, I, I looked at this, these rubble beds. Some of them were from the World War II and in lots of recent ones. And when you study these rubble beds, you'll see that these are killing fields for coral larvae. The coral larvae come on, if you break them, if you saw them, you'll see layer upon layer of dead coral, coral juveniles on these, um, on these rubble pieces. And so it attracts the larvae and then it kills them. So I looked at, I was snorkeling over and I saw this purple coral on the edge and how pieces had broken off and were living in the, living in, in, in the rubble zone. So I tried breaking corals and I threw them down on the rubble and it was a calm lagoon area and they just grew. Wow. So uh, these are pictures from the Caribbean, but it, the same thing works in the Caribbean. Okay, so that's drop and scatter. But anyway, so in, this is that same picture. So uh, I started working with corals in Ponape where I was there, worked for a few years, and everybody said, Austin, you should go get your PhD. Austin, you should get your PhD. So I went to Puerto Rico to get my PhD and began uh, working there. I think that was the first coral work in the Caribbean um, that was focused. Anyway, so I was focused on staghorn corals before they were declared endangered species in the Caribbean. And it wasn't my fault, but... <laughs> But they, they did continue to decline. So, but the, the, the staghorns, everything I'd learned in the Pacific applied to the Caribbean. And then everything I've learned since in the Caribbean has applied to the Pacific. You might as well just erase Panama and call it the same ocean as far as the deeper ecology. Oh yeah, we don't have crown of thorn starfish over there, but we have voracious fireworms and voracious cor um, coral killing snails that are really deadly. And so, um, but anyway, so the, the staghorn corals can be weedy and they can also take over a reef. They, they invest their longevity into growing fast, growing fast, growing fast. They grow quickly, they grow quickly, but a hurricane comes, whoop, they're gone. So there, there are many similarities. So the Caribbean is ahead of us in, in, a, in a backward sense where so much of their coral is already gone. And we need to look at the Caribbean as a model for what have they done with that and how have they advanced. So, they are years ahead of the Great Barrier Reef as far as restoration. And I'm telling you, the lessons learned, nearly every single one applies to here. Okay, these pesky damselfish. We got the pesky damselfish. And they do all kinds of bad stuff. And um, they can also stop the coral reproduction. Now, a cropper is ice cream. No matter what ocean it's in, it's ice cream. Now here, the crown of thorns love it. The snails do too. But in the Caribbean, it is also ice cream. And that's one of the reasons it grows. It compensates for that by being a very fast grower and it reproduces well. Okay, so what are we restoring? In the Caribbean, endangered or threatened coral species. I think those lessons learned actually apply here. Don't think of what the condition of the reef is now. Think about what is it gonna be in, in 100 years? So if we start looking at each species as going, it will become an endangered species. Okay, look at it that way. That's how serious this is and you start managing your restoration sites in that manner, then to restore the reproduction of the species becomes a major goal. Instead of record, everybody's talking about coral cover. I'm saying to hell with coral cover, let's make sure that each species is reproducing in a, and we have healthy patches. So coral cover is important, biodiversity, all these kinds of things, calcification rates, you want the reef to keep growing when the sea level rises. And especially the thermal, everything we do, we need to look at thermal tolerance now. I've had most of my work die in Fiji. 
in the last bleaching. And I will never plant, I've sworn anyway, you're my witnesses, I will never plant a non-thermally a, a cold adapted coral again, because it's just wasting time. Okay, because ultimately it will die. So, and the last one, ecological balance and health, we have to focus on the wider ecological picture. Okay, this is a picture I draw, drew way back when I first moved to Puerto Rico. Um, and if you could look at the, um, the, the, the massive coral there, that's over time. And if it weren't for hurricanes, there would be nothing but a cropra, nothing but a cropra, okay? And these great um, ecologists, Joseph Connell, did, a, did studies and found out that, you know, the maximum biodiversity on the reef is not 100% coral cover. The maximum biodiversity is around 30, maybe 40%. You don't want 100% coral cover because you get a domination of, of one species. The, 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 elk, um, the um, table corals and the, and the staghorn corals will dominate everything. And so you know reefs that are dominated in that way. And we say, oh, wonderful. But well, it's low biodiversity. Okay. <laughs> Start thinking that way. Um, okay. This is something I drew from my Ponape work that's never been published. Okay. Where you fish out colonies, you fish out branches from the stag from the stagastes, and plant them directly into the sand or rubble, and the, the changes that take place, you know that when you take those dead branches out, they're only live on the end. Within a year, complete resheeting and regrowth. So it it grows all the way down, and you've got a beautiful, healthy, reproductive colony. Like wow, it looks like it's five or ten years old, and it's you know it, it was you know it's just a year, and it's already reproductive. Okay, so this is the process. Now, crown of thorn starfish needs to be in this, in this thing and other things as well. So we need to look at the ecology. We need to look at, you need to understand reefs grow backwards. Most of the growth is actually in the lagoon, okay? We need to start looking at the geology of what we're doing. What we do has geological implications. So here in this picture, I've planted corals in the lagoon, which you can do in the sand, and look in 100 years, 200 years, you're going to end up building a whole reef flat up there. Um, and my, a lot of my friends in Micronesia, the old men used to say, there used to, this used to be deep water, and now there's a reef up to the surface. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, we could hardly see the corals on the bottom. Now look where it is. Okay, so things are changing. Okay, uh-oh, I didn't do this. Okay, so staghorn corals mostly reproduce through fragmentation. Table and elkhorn corals mostly break into big pieces, but they, they give a lot of uh, larval recruitment as well. The tiny, the digitate corals, the small branch ones, uh, they, you, they can shed a few fragments when triggerfish attack them, but, um, but they focus mostly on sexual reproduction. The massive corals is rarely fragment, mostly sex. So we need to start thinking about how do they reproduce naturally, and I believe that staghorn corals are going to become endangered species here. That'll be the very first species that become extinct because it's happened in Hawaii. A thousand years ago, staghorns became extinct. The Caribbean, it nearly became extinct. It's still not reproducing sexually, okay? Nobody can find the recruits, almost ne never, almost never. In Christmas Island, Kiribati, where, it's, where we had 14 months of bleaching, staghorn is extinct. Extinct, not a single staghorn species, gone. Okay, so it looks like I see a pattern in my own, and that's not published, right? So I see a pattern, staghorns that reproduce by fragmentation and don't rely on sex, they are the most endangered. Where normally there are weeds, so they don't have to worry about it, all right? Because they break up and every little piece becomes a new colony. Okay, so these methods are what you haven't seen yet here. You make these tables, you have cookies on both sides, you have ropes, you plant all kinds of species. The species that grow best on the cookies, don't put staghorns there, don't. Okay, but everything else you can put on the cookies. Okay, staghorns grow very well on ropes. Things that are tightly branched or massives grow on the cookies. Um, you need fish in the sites. Look how deep it is, two meters. Okay, we get, these groupers are incredibly important for keeping the stagastes out of the site. Okay, you need groupers, even if you feed them a little bit, okay. The maintenance, we don't do any maintenance. I've done this method in Honduras, I've done it in Solomon Islands, I've done it in Fiji, I've done it in um, Belize, I've done it in Dominican Republic. We don't ever use any toothbrushes on our, on our, on our sites, okay? The, the A-frame method, this, this is really good for testing things. If you wanna, if once you have a genotype, you can test it, put it on the frame, go put the frame in extremely hot water, okay? So this is just one year's of growth. So did you see that? Boom. Oh my God, oh my God. It's on seagrass, guess what? If you put 
a few little of these test nurseries in your seagrass beds, you won't get any crown of thorns. Crown of thorns don't live in the seagrass, okay? There are ways of growing corals in shallow water, completely avoiding the predators. If you put them on pure white sand, they'll also, um, but the seagrass is great because the grazers live in the seagrass. So we use seagrass beds as rapid grow out sites. They don't hurt the seagrass at all. It's above the seagrass in this case, but the, but the cleaning, the little baby juvenile fish are there and they clean it as clean as a whistle, okay? Now that's one year of growth. Did you see that? Okay, and that's, that was not even in the beginning. Okay, that's one year of growth in shallow water where you get some water motion, it's good too. Okay, so you trim them, you plant them on frames. And this is a test frame with several genotypes. And this was an early experiment. It was actually a growth frame and the bleaching hit in Dominican Republic. So some corals need to be retired. They bleach easily and we don't propagate those. Or maybe we could, have a, we could move them to a site that, that we didn't expect bleaching to occur because we do need to somehow conserve that biodiversity if we can. Okay, so this mimics natural fragmentation. The, 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 the drop and scatter, um, they grab on and they hold everything together. So it will re-cement the reef, but it only works in those sweet spots behind the reef where you don't have lots of wave action, okay? So this drop and scatter technique has sweet spots, okay? We do it in the Solomon Islands, Fiji, everywhere. These are colonies that were cultured on the table. Drop and scatter, no need to attach. Okay, when you grow them up on the rubble, you can then, then big colonies of staghorn can just be thrown on the sand, drop and scatter, create a whole new reef. Search for corals that are being endangered. This, this, this little diploria colony is gonna be killed. It's going to die. So rescue it, okay? Don't plant your corals on top of things. Okay, plug in, don't use the nail method. It's a waste of time, sorry. <laughs> uh, cementing, cemented rosettes, look at that, okay? And so, so you got your mother, instead of targeting big pieces, you could every three months take little one or two centimeter branches. And this is actually overdone. Lisa did this, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay, so that could have been four. So how much research is there? I'm telling you, this, these are not published reports. This is what needs to be done for research. Look at all the research topics are. This is the most effective way of outplanting, where you peg a rope, you put them in a rope, you nail it down, boom, okay? You can use that for, uh, for other corals as well that are not just staghorn. You can grow them on the rope, then peg them down. Okay, anyway, am I already finished? So um, I didn't, I, I, I have much more to say. So I, that's okay, that's okay. But coral gardening will not save the planet. It'll be people. And if we don't get carbon dioxide under control, we only, it's only buying us 80 to 100 years, okay? So this is not the solution. We have to present this as giving us time and we need that time. Okay. Thank you, Austin. I appreciate the struggles of getting 30 years of knowledge into 15 minutes, uh, but we have to move on. Uh, and so next we have Stuart Christie, who is presenting about the first coral nursery on the Great Barrier Reef. Okay. Um, Good morning, my name is Stuart Christie. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Reef Restoration Foundation. We're a not-for-profit organization, uh, a social enterprise based in Cairns. So before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land which we meet today. And I'd also like to acknowledge basically my fellow directors, co-founders, volunteers, uh, financial supporters who have all kind of made this thing possible. So really, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk to you about kind of three key, the three key challenges, I suppose, that we faced in establishing the first coral nursery at uh, Great Barrier Reef um, at Fitzroy Island last December. I'm going to talk to you about the solutions, how do we overcame them, where we're going, and uh, how you can get involved and actually kind of make a difference in the Great Barrier Reef. So as you can tell from my accent, um, I'm not originally from here, I'm from Scotland. Uh, my background's in the construction industry, started as a carpenter, mature student, civil engineering, a lot more engineers here than I had ever anticipated being, so every second person seems to be an engineer. Um, ran major sort of infrastructure projects for about 16 years, uh, became the CEO of the Economic Development Organization here in the region, and then really got into sustainable development, set up my own company, 
And then uh, a couple of years ago, I met Gary and we kind of set up uh, Reef Restoration Foundation. So we've talked extensively about the kind of problems facing the reef in the last couple of days. And I'm not going to go into them in any kind of detail, but one of the key things for us, it's a massive economic driver for this region, uh, for coastal communities throughout Queensland. You know, it's $6 billion a year in, in expenditure, uh, 64,000 jobs it supports. So there have been two kind of recent back-to-back -back bleaching events, which kind of created you know, extensive negative media uh, affecting you know, the kind of the destination, about the reef. And more importantly, effectively, it started kind of really affecting, particularly in our community, um, the, the mental health really of kind of people in our community about really seeing that there's kind of a lack of hope and optimism for the kind of the reef. So how we kind of got started, Gary McKenna, who's here today, effectively is our kind of founder. Uh, Gary was during the first kind of bleaching event. He's a kind of a coral hobbyist at home. He's got his own tank, was kind of cutting coral, seeing how it kind of started regenerating, regrowing. I thought, well, is this something that we can actually be taken to a bigger scale? Uh, did some more research, seeing how this was happened overseas, got involved in a social enterprise incubator program. I was a mentor on that program. I got involved with Gary. Uh, we decided, how do we kind of scale it? I then got, and got Rob, Adam, uh, effectively El Marie involved to kind of bring that team who were kind of diverse skills in science, project delivery, uh, finance and tourism. And then we also uh, managed to kind of persuade Ken Inamar, who's kind of an international expert based in Florida Keys, to kind of come and support and provide some strategic advice to us. So it was clear to us that, that with the first bleaching event, and particularly the second, that we really needed to kind of end up seeing some action and to happen now to start regenerating some hope and optimism for the future of the reef. So these are the kind of the three key challenges, I suppose, that we sort of looked at uh, that drove the solution that we end up picking and how we kind of moved forward. Um, and it was really kind of important for us to kind of end up being really clear on who the customer was, who's going to pay for this solution, what solution do they want to kind of see and for what problem, what will the regulators and what will allow us to do, so Gibrumpa, um, QPWS and the Agriculture and Fisheries and to actually then secure the investment and prove that this thing actually works. So who's the customer? Today, effectively, the kind of the key customer for kind of undertaking restoration projects or any environmental projects on the reef has also been uh, the state government and the federal government. Um, but what we wanted to look at is, is who else kind of benefits and where can we actually kind of get started. So this is a slide from the United States just showing kind of wealth and it kind of builds on some of the stuff that Rich Gilmer talked about this morning, but really about where it actually is the kind of the wealth. The problems facing the reef are massive, they're complex, they're complicated, much more than any kind of government can actually kind of fund. So we looked at, you know, where is the kind of the wealth? So the corporate sector, private individuals who actually want to get involved are ready to do that. How do we actually kind of create mechanisms for them to get involved? So we really focused on the, the tourism sector, who are obviously a kind of key beneficiary of the reef, um, and how do we actually kind of end up helping them to kind of get, get some solutions that are actually going to make a difference, because they were crying out for wanting to do something now and very quickly that actually can start protecting the value of their assets. So to me, effectively, good process gives you good outcomes. We are a small startup. We wanted to kind of move quickly. This is the approach that we've ended up adopting. It's very similar to adaptive management techniques. So it's about learning fast, improving, and using kind of very limited resources in a very targeted way. So learning fast and getting going quickly. I'd, ideally, I'd like it to, to look on the left-hand side, the kind of process we went through. It really is more like the and I had more here than many use when I start the process and look what's happened to me. So as uh, uh, Frank Ma uh, Mr. Mars basically talked about earlier on, there's a massive need. Great Barrier Reef is huge, but there's a very limited number of sites within the Great Barrier Reef that's actually used by the tourism sector that, that supports that $6 billion a year industry. So where we end up, it was clear from the discussions we'd had with the tourism sector that, that 
you know, the problem that they wanted solving was to end up having something that gave them a proactive solution that could start looking after the health of the reef and that protect their, their assets, their, their businesses. So our mission really is to kind of end up regenerating high coral, high value coral reefs by using proven technology. So what we're focused on is actually delivering technical solutions or solutions that have actually been proven in, the great, uh, in other locations. So we're not an R&D organization, we're all about delivery and implementation. So when we started looking at what are the solutions out there, here's some of the solutions that, that have been proven are out there. But what we were looking for was something that could be deployed quite quickly, was proven, had low capital and operational costs, and was something that we felt that, that the regulators would see as potentially low risk to allow us to kind of get going. So we quickly kind of narrowed down into kind of coral nurseries, looked at different solutions. Again, there's kind of pros and cons of both, um, but coral tree nurseries was effectively the kind of the methodology that we thought would be most appropriate to get us going initially, um, because it's out of the water column, less risk of being kind of uh, taken out by cots. Um, um, it can, you can lower it and increase it in the water columns, uh, you know, in the, the upcoming of a kind of a bleaching event, potentially end up being kind of cooler water for periods of time and less likely to be impacted by kind of cyclones. So this is the process. We kind of collect some coral that we know have kind of naturally more heat tolerant. So we through the last couple of bleaching events, take cuttings of that, it gets hung on the frames. The frames allow it to kind of accelerate the growth of that coral. And then we start out planting the coral. Um, so we've just got the permit uh, yesterday. Thank you very much, Rianne, to allow us to do our first plan, which we hope will happen. So, as you might have seen from some of the presentations this morning, when you start the regulars seem quite overwhelming. So, we got sort of the discussion through, and how do we kind of end up doing that? So, up until before May last year, you weren't allowed to do any intervention uh, at that summit. It was recognised there was a need for our solutions. So that happened at the end of May last year. Within six weeks after that, we had a site effectively to set up uh, coral nurseries in different locations. And uh, within three months, working really closely with um, Rianne, with Julia, and with Saskia. Uh, here today. I'd really like to thank you guys for really working exceptionally hard and working with us effectively to getting the permit. Um, when we got the permit, we'd been talking to the kind of tourism industry about funding. They thought they didn't tell us this until afterwards, but they thought that we wouldn't get a permit for 19 months. When we turned up and we said we got really committed to actually getting happening in the water by the end of the year. So we secured some seed funding effectively from uh, these organizations to actually get started and to prove the concept really quickly as part of that lean start process just to kind of keep moving. We also partnered effectively with Trotwater and Reef Ecologic who effectively are providing the science effectively to our um, to, to prove uh, you know that the motivation is actually happening. And with the thanks of many of the stars sitting in the audience today, actually, we actually got the first. So we really had one weekend, one window of opportunity to actually make it happen. So we got it in and it kind of it started to kind of grow. So these are some images effectively taken last weekend of the same coral fragment that was put in in December, now in July. This year, we had the opposite of the last couple of years where we had a big wet season. Um, at Fitzroy Island, effectively, the water quality hasn't been fantastic. So we've been really pleased that the corals have actually kind of continued to grow. So from 24 fragments initially that we did 240 corals, those corals have all kind of grown in size from 40 to 150 percent each. Um, and the, the, the performance. 
So from in, we were then able to demonstrate we had some traction, so we got some support through the National Australia Bank. Didn't get all the 1.6 million, unfortunately, but we got a little chunk of that, which they kind of has really helped us to kind of start moving forward. Support from some of these other uh, organisations, we were recognised by the Queen's Accelerator Program to help us develop our ideas. So our goal, effectively, within three years, to be growing and planting 25,000 corals a year. And, and as I said, we really want to be a kind of a development, you know, an implementation organisation. So what we started was to get started with the least risk to get things kind of going. Uh, this is our kind of timeline, and what we get from this conference is, you know, as you've got kind of proven technology ready to go, uh, we really want to be a kind of a partner that helps you implement some of the, the, these ideas once they've been proven and they're ready to go. So what, what we're looking for really today is kind of partnership opportunities. So if you're thinking of setting up for restoration to Great Barrier Reef, um, please come and talk to us. We've been through so much pain in the last 18 years, like you to not to have to go through so much pain. So please come and come and work with us. Um, if you're a technology provider that you've got solutions that are ready to go, um, please come and talk to us. If you've got some solutions, I more efficient at what we do. We'd love to talk to you. If you've got any that are sitting around that you want to really kind of invest in our organization, Mr. Mars. Uh, thank you very much. And um, you know, why wouldn't you look at part of the track? We've got an established track record. We're focused on delivery and implementation. We've actually got something that's kind of actually got a really strong kind of board and team that've got diverse skills that to can make stuff. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions or to kind of have a chat with you afterwards. We're running a little bit behind, so we're going to move on. And if you have any questions, just grab Stuart. Uh, session. Uh, we're moving on to uh, another one of the giants in the field. So next up is David Koko telling us about massive coral uh, propagation in Hawaii. So, um, first of all, I want to thank Austin. Uh, Austin and I have bumped into each other over the years a lot. and. He's, he actually he kind of stole some of my fun because he raised a number of the issues I was hoping to, to bring up that I thought hadn't been raised here yet. Um, overlap. Um, in, you, I, okay, first of all, I'm from Hawaii. Hawaii is one of the most expensive places to work in the world. It's one of the most isolated. Our reefs are, I mean, we're an outlier. We, we, they're weird compared to everywhere else. We don't have a cropper in any sense of the word. Um, corals are extremely slow as a year on average. So it forces us to move in very different directions and, and, and that's caused us to develop things slightly differently than others. But in general, we look at two different terms of reefs um, and corals in general. You have the extremely fast growing crops and, and a lot of the images you've been seeing over the last couple of days have been doing this kind of thing, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. These are invertebrate corals. The tissue exists on the outside of the skeleton, and that type of coral is very different than massive corals and some of the perforate corals, where the tissues extend way down into the skeleton. Ecologically, they're, they're like apples. We, we haven't been really treating them that way. Um, these imperfect corals trend Birds in water nurseries, these fast growth techniques that you've been hearing about. Slow growing to a place that's in very cold water like Hawaii with extremely um, with slow extreme. growing corals, one to two centimeters a year, your techniques are very different. That said, those aren't the kind of reefs we want in most places in the world. We want reefs that are made up of a blend of corals. Um, we want 
the digiforms, the tables, the columnar, the plate, the, the branching, and the massive corals. We want those assemblages, and we want the species diversities that are associated with them. And what we need to be thinking, I mean, it was great that, that most of the efforts have focused on fast growing. Now we've got to start thinking about how we apply things to grow the, all the other types of corals, and not just hard corals. I mean, there's been very little discussion here about soft corals, uh, sea fans, um, corallomorphs, zoanthids, uh, large sponges, all these, uh, and Presto's coral and algae, there's been a little, little bit of, but these are all the components of a reef, and, and we need to be considering that if we're going to be talking at the scale of ecological restoration of reefs. So from, a, a, from our perspective, we're an extreme, we do things a little differently, and just to kind of move you in a different direction, you know, um, if I were to ask you really quickly, what would you prefer, 90% coral cover on your reef or 15% coral cover? Most of you are going to shift and, and, and instantly say 90% cover. But if I were to say it in another way, um, should I be producing thousands of coral frags, small coral frags, or just a couple really big colonies? Most of you would still say produce lots of the small coral frags. All right, so let's, I mean, coral cover is like plant cover, okay? That's 90% plant cover. That means everything you wanted. That, I've got, as far as you can see, there's plants, all right? That's 15% cover. Very, very different. They're both plants. And, and actually, to be fair, I mean, if it wasn't grasses, we could say small plants will eventually grow into big plants. So I'll gain those services and functions that that big tree has. But the, the difference is what your time frame is. But so far, we've been mostly focusing on putting out lots and lots and lots of small things. And we've got to keep in mind, these big things provide very dramatic services and functions. And how do we get there? So size matters. Most animals have, actually animals and plants have something called a size refuge. It's a very important ecological concept. Um, a number of practitioners here, I'm, I can see three of you instantly that I know are using this because you're targeting putting out corals at a size of reproduction in order to, to take advantage of some of this. These types of nurseries are, are in-water nurseries people have been talking about a lot at this meeting, and they're great. They work extremely well with the types of corals we've been talking about. But you're going to be hearing from Vaughn and, and myself and maybe one or two others about different types of, of nurseries focusing more on the slower growing uh, corals, the, the perforate corals. You're going to be hearing about this term called microfragmentation, um, where we kind of trick the coral into growing fast by doing a number of things, one of which is by making it really small. You increase that surface area to volume ratio, which allows it to grow faster in all directions. There's also some thought that you're, you're basically turning on a stress response, so you're going to get them growing faster that way. But at these extremely small sizes, they are prone to stress from other variables, so they, they require some care. And here's what we're doing in Hawaii. We're doing the microfragmentation. Um, we are putting out modules that are fully covered. And actually, it's one of our tenants. We don't put out things that aren't, aren't less than 100% covered when we put them out in the field. And we have to do this, as I said, because of these conditions that I talked about earlier that, that are affecting, um, make Hawaii an outlier. So techniques like this really don't work well in Hawaii. The in-water nurseries haven't worked, um, and they primarily do that cooler water, uh, slow growth rate. Uh, so when we went to, to learn, to think about how we were going to produce a nursery, um, I, I'm a regulator, uh, I manage reefs for the state, I deal with a lot of researchers, but I also deal with aquariums, and I was dealing with some aquariums and talking with some people on the U.S. mainland who were dealing with aquariums, and found out that for decades there have been guys in garages in the middle of the Midwest growing corals, fragmenting corals, and because it was difficult to, to move material around, had been sharing it in a small networks, and, and they kind of stumbled upon the same thing that years later we did. In addition, there were very, very large um, aquarium trade companies that had developed these huge warehouses, many of them in places like California, where they were fragmenting, developing raceways, specialized light systems, specialized water systems, and talking with them, we were able to modify these techniques to work for resource management. But we have a problem, because we're dealing with a slow-growing coral, and it, you know, with a fast-growing coral, I can go break off a piece, and the idea is it'll recover fast enough so there's very little, if any, impact that you can measure in the natural environment. Well, with a slow-growing coral, if I take a coral from here to bring into my nursery to go then restore a, an impacted reef, I have that impact on the, the area where I collected it from. So we needed sources of corals that wouldn't cause impacts. 
And luckily in Hawaii, we actually have a lot of coral growing in our commercial harbors and our recreational harbors and our man-made structures all over the place. And from the state's perspective, those corals represent far fewer ecological services and functions than corals on natural reefs. So that's what our sources are for these corals. But collecting corals from those environments pose other problems. There's invasive species, there's disease, there's pollutants. So when we bring corals into our nursery, they go immediately into a, a one-month quarantine where they're evaluated daily. And in some cases, we even fragment them to much smaller sizes to minimize pollutants and parasites. From that, we then conduct microfragmentation in specialized rooms we have where I'm, I'm give you a general, we'll, we'll target 10 centimeters of source material. We'll, we'll break that down into very small one centimeter fragments. We get about 140 uh, fragments from 10 centimeters of source material. That is then placed onto, um, uh, well, it's cut using a very specialized saw that it's, it's like a tile saw, but it runs salt water through it to minimize stress on the corals. Those are then placed onto prepared modules, which have been um, soaked for at least one month to leach out any, any chemical issues and then bleached and cleaned. And then we attach the, uh, these small fragments using surgical superglue, um, once again, to minimize any tissue interactions and the, the surgical superglue will set underwater. Those are then placed in very highly specialized aquariums. These are kind of the equivalent of a five-star hotel. So they're getting perfect light, um, very, uh, uh, directed light that we control electronically over time. A, a lot of uh, time and effort spent on water quality. Um, and uh, we also have specialized foods we're giving them. So we're doing everything we can over a short period of time to maximize their growth. And as I said, in the wild, these things are growing one to two centimeters a year. During this phase in the nursery, we're getting that up to five to six centimeters a year. So in about eight months, I can go from having a 10 centimeter source uh, colony to a 42 centimeter um, module that's ready to put out in the field. And here you see them in, in our, our specialized aquarium as they're growing. Um, here you see one that's almost completely fused over that time period. And um, th that's the take home period, the take home message is that for a place where corals grow so, so, so slow, for me to be able to save 20 to 25 years of growth and get all this out in one year is a huge gain in ecological services and functions, which we can then use to rationalize the, the extreme high cost of this program. Um, but there's a problem because I've been raising them in the equivalent of a five-star hotel. I have to figure out how to get them to be homeless and back out on the street when I put them out on the reef. And so we have a whole acclimation process. It's over a period of one month where basically the, we have these very large outdoor tanks. We can control sediment in it. We're actually adding sediment in slowly to create turbidity to duplicate the conditions they're going to be outplanted to. We vary the light to, to re recreate the depth they're going to be um, planted at and the cloud and light conditions for the reef they're going to be planted at. And we have unidirectional wave makers so we can create the surge that on the reef flat or on the submerged reef that they're going to be exposed to over time. And after a month, we then put them out. And because we're trying to maximize our investment, we're target placing them into, quote, MPAs. These aren't necessarily um, uh, dedicated MPAs, like a government-run MPA. Some of them are. But there's other types of protected areas. Uh, for example, in the US now, if you have an airport near, near the coastline, there is a security zone that extends out into the water. And those are great places to put corals. The reason you want to put it into a semi-protected area is you're trying to control as many of the human-caused impacts as you can in order to maximize the survival of those, those organisms against things you can't control. And here's an example of some of our modules that have gone out um, immediately one month after transplantation and then nine months later. We're up to two years now. That color you see on the right is pretty similar to what we're seeing, um, very robust, healthy colonies. Um, and, and especially compared to the same species at, this, at the same site that was naturally occurring there. I should mention, we do not introduce um, new species into new areas in Hawaii, and we're only dealing with native uh, species for what we're doing. This, this, that was a native parietes. This is a native montipora. I actually have 12 species right now that we're culturing and putting out on the reef with these modules. I have a total of 40 species in the nursery. Um, but most of those are rare, and I'll talk about those in a second. And here's our test spot, and you can see a variety of modules of uh, various ages and various species that have been put out. Right now, we're dealing with 42 centimeters, but next year, we're moving up to 80 
to one meter in size modules we're putting out. And the interesting thing about that is it's the same time period. So we'll be producing 82, 84 centimeter to one meter wide mar modules in a single year from about 20 centimeters to 25 centimeters of donor material. And that represents in Hawaii, given those growth rates, 150 to 200 years of, of, of gain of growth. In addition, as I said, we also at the nursery are maintaining rare species. I have about 28 species that are considered rare or uncommon. Most of them are endemic. Some of them have actually disappeared from their source sites in Hawaii because a lot of our rare species are in single bays or embayments. Um, two of them we've targeted for uh, using this fast growth technique, and we're starting to grow them on small modules. And you can see those small modules there. And after the summer heat maximum, which will be in September this year, we'll be out planting them back into their uh, original reefs where they uh, disappeared from. Um, this is kind of an overview chart, kind of gives you a broad uh, view of, of our program and the benefits and disadvantages of, of why we're doing certain things the way we are. And then next steps, as I said, are currently with the size of the nursery I have, it is a land-based nursery, it is very expensive to run. Um, we can produce a maximum of about 80, 42 centimeter modules a year. Uh, this fall, we're, we're increasing the size of the nursery and we'll be up to 220 modules a year. Uh, once again, 42 centimeter modules, but we're also creating the, the ability to go up to one meter in that same, same facility. I'm doubling my staff, so I'm going to be hiring um, folks within the next month. I'll probably get about eight people working for me soon. And um, we're expanding our rare species program. And we also want, to, we, I, I should mention that I just talked about the fast growth, but we have other stuff going on with asexual larvae, sexual larvae, um, and some other projects. And we are gonna be creating a crustose coral and algae project because we recognize that's critical for our reef survival in addition to the corals. And finally, um, just to put this all in perspective, so we're talking here about the effects of climate change and, and having enough lead time to try to get these programs up in years, perhaps decades, to try to save reefs, all right? This was about a week and a half ago, all right? This is from Fissure 8 on the Big Island. We have an active flow. We had an existing marine protected area at this site that had been there for 20 years. And it was a very, very unique marine protected area because it was a tide pool complex. It was these huge tide Some of them were about uh, 25 feet deep. Um, a meter's a, a, a translate it. Um, <laughs> this is inside that tide pool. So you're looking at corals there that are over 150 years old in a tide pool. And that's why we had made it a, a marine protected area. This lava flow came through. It wiped wiped out everything, killed everything. We lost an entire MPA in three hours because of a lava flow. Never happened before. But you see the circles? Two years ago, because of a threat of a bleaching event, I had sent one of my technicians and he had collected those corals, fragments of those corals which came into our nursery. So it shows the advantage of doing this for long term and we may be able to reintroduce that to that island later on. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. Um, we're going to keep going our journey around the world, and we're heading to the Seychelles now, and Louise Lang is going to tell us about her work from there. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not a giant, but <clears throat> I have experience. And uh, I came here with Austin, the other great Austin in the room. And um, we traveled to the Seychelles in 2015 uh, and were part of a training program in large-scale coral restoration organized by um, the NGO Nature Seychelles. And in 2016, we became project coordinator for this project. So this presentation is about our story there from 2016, fighting for the, fighting for the survival of a restored reef in the Seychelles. So I will start with sharing with you uh, the results of our monitoring study during the 2016 uh, event. And then I will talk about the target management actions we took 
after uh, the bleaching to promote the recovery of the site and uh, the area. From the propagation of supercorals, the control of invasive uh, coral eating species, and the identification of uh, reefs of hope. So in January 2016, we were given the task to manage uh, this reef in the Seychelles Inner Islands um, that um, was within the MPA of Cousin Island Special Reserve. Since 1998, Cousin has been managed by Nature Seychelles, and this NGO is a partner of uh, BirdLife International. So this was no ordinary reef. Uh, in 2010, Nature Seychelles started the initiative to bring it back to life after it was lethally bleached by the 98 El Nino and further degraded to the state of rubble um, by the 2004 tsunami. Funded by the USAID, this project achieved the restoration of a reef, the area of a uh, football field by successfully transplanting 24,000 nursery grown corals and reaching a biodiversity of 34 coral species, with 90% of which being Acropora and Posterpora species common to the area, and considered pioneers uh, to settle and colonize on the reef. And so the objective of the project was really to reset the foundations of a healthy reef and uh, recreate this attraction hub for natural recruitment, and eventually reestablish the goods and services intrinsic to these ecosystems, like fisheries, which is pretty much the only thing that matters for locals in the Seychelles, justifying an MPA. So this was achieved by applying the three-step garden concept, um, harvesting coral fragments from large coral colonies from a donor sites, putting them on nurseries for up to 18 months for growth, and finally transplanting them onto selected degraded sites. So as many island nations, Seychelles really uh, has a vital dependence to its coral reef. It has an economy based on fishing and tourism. This is uh, in front of our office in 2017, uh, where the Bayer Reef is heavily eroded, not recovering, very porous. And so the coast has been um, eroding dramatically since 98. So this is a common scene over there now. So I'll get to the thick of it. So in October 2015, the first warnings we got of the global bleaching turning, glo um, turning global was in October 2015, published by NOAA. Meanwhile, in the Seychelles, uh, fish were dying and corals were bleaching already to, due to an harmful algal bloom in October. And so our transplanted site went pretty well during this HAB, but we did lose some corals on our healthy control sites. So as heartbreaking as this was, this bleaching was a very good opportunity for us to put our reef to the test and de demonstrate the project's concept, which is propagating coral survivors and uh, uh, survivors of past bleaching events can increase the resilience of coral reefs to, past, uh, to future bleaching events. So as every good uh, impact monitoring, we uh, wanted to have a before and, and after impact data. So we started the bleaching monitoring in February before any signs of bleaching and performed it on the restored site, on the healthy control site, using a point intersect transect method, uh, averaging 54 transects monthly, and that happened during seven months. So. The first symptoms uh, of the reef appeared on the restored site um, on recruits, and by March, the reef was seriously starting to pale. By April, sea surface temperature average reached a peak, and widespread mortality, uh, widespread bleaching happened within 15 days. Uh, the highest temperature recorded on the, the restored site was at 12 meters depth, and that was 31.6 degrees. So by May, we had 80% of our and fish had also left the show. And by June, uh, the temperature was to follow whether the reef had recovered or not. And this is the result. So this is a comparative study of the bleaching response between the restored site and the healthy control site. Uh, shading intensity represents progressive coral bleaching conditions from no bleaching on lightest gray to bleached in gray to uh, dead in darkest gray. And the black line is the sea surface temperature 
monthly averages. So the analysis reveals strong difference between the transition and impact of coral bleaching at each site. The healthy control site shows early mortality before even showing uh, bleaching, and that is probably due to the HAB. Uh, the bleaching increased on both sites in April and reached a maximum in May. Mortality continued to progressively rise on the control site, but remained low on the restored sites, so we were very hopeful, until July when it suddenly boomed. By August, mortality was dominant on both sites. So why did our super corals die? Uh, maybe they were not super corals. Uh, they were, the fragments were collected from large colonies in 2010, which is 12 years after the nine year bleaching. So it's hard to know for sure they were survivors of the event. The heat stress in the Seychelles was uh, more intense than longer than ever, true. And the reef health was also affected already by the 2015 HAB. But we think um, our corals died uh, due to a combination of all these reasons, but we can talk about it. Uh, so we also observed widespread mortality on the donor side. And what we also uh, saw during the dives were a large amount of fragments of opportunity in this large colonies that were still alive post bleaching. So this leads me to our first target management action, which is the propagation of heat tolerant coral material. And this was also an opportunity to minimize the harvesting impact on the donor side. So our collection efforts generated over 2,100 uh, fragments. The stock biodiversity reached eight species of Acropora and Posipora, whatever we could find on the site. And scaring and sheeting happened within a few weeks for all species. The ecosystem soon became a floating, uh, floating ecosystem. Sorry, the nursery became a floating ecosystem. Species like the endangered humpback parafish. And it was before we even transplanted our corals. The only problem, though, was the snacks we had tagged for growth monitoring but they did leave us a few. So I can show you our uh, annual growth rate on the nursery with fossil pressuring really good growth rate, really good. Uh, and these two fragments increased their initial size by 522% and 819% in 12 months. It's on the acropora fragments that were not coping well with nursery conditions, we now Austin, and we know the reason why. We did, though, an early transplantation of these uh, fragments back to our restored site. So in March 2017, we transplanted 547 acropora and 260 acropora formosa, and they did much better once transplanted uh, a lot. And as we're at it, we also noticed a lot of uh, small young branching colonies growing on loose rubble next to the site. And we did collect, um, we collect 140 of those and transplanted uh, them directly back onto the restored piece of rock they were growing on to the substrate. So this technique was After 12 months of growth, we could uh, finally transplant our short side and we Undertook this uh, at a rate of about 30 corals per dive per diver, and most of it Austin and I. Um, there you go. This is a uh, happy poster for a very close hours after transplantation. You can see points of cement to the substrate, connecting the coral to the substrate and within a couple of months over the cement, taking its natural tree like shape. After the bleaching event, we were happy to see uh, 2,000 corals that were back on the restored site and away again, and more have been planted since then. And there's been many monitorings performed on the site about uh, free fish populations, benefit populations, and um, um, monitoring uh, rates. And 
to show that planting corals on a reef, on a barren reef, attracts baby corals. And it's been proven before, and we kept uh, monitoring the event. After we lost some colonies, the site was still showing increased uh, signs of recruitment and settlement. So it suggests that the reef was still playing its role as an attraction for uh, baby corals, and that was very positive for us. Uh, last interesting point about this, that our newly transplanted corals uh, were targeted by parrotfish, whereas resident corals were being untouched. Nursery conditions might have given our corals a different smell, a different hue, or a different color that the parrotfish could easily target. Um, but this stopped after so they did adapt and they did scour. And this parrotfish predation was a really good test for us because if our calls made it through that, we knew that we did a good job of managing them. So this was a big concern for us. A bigger concern for us was another type of small coral eating species that we had to tackle after the beaching event. Uh, because a couple months ago, the survivors were now being infested with Jupella. And so I actually went, what, <laughs> in my rig, not believing that um, all this work we had done, little snails were finishing the last survivors. Um, so, but this is basically what happens when an ecosystem shifts out of balance, everything kind of goes to hell. But we did uh, collect about 2,000 of those guys with tweezers, just, you know, desperate, uh, desperately trying to save our, our, our sites. And uh, as you would expect, it, the same happened on the donor sites. Uh, but collection dives for Drupal have been very time consuming and uh, not easy to undertake on this site exposed to swell. We decided to salvage the infested corals, the infested uh, coral tissue that was still alive, like on this colony, place it on a nursery to increase our stock of heat tolerant uh, coral material. So this added a further 1,600 super corals to the nursery, and 10% of those would be planted back onto the donor site. Our total stock reached uh, 3,750 uh, heat-resistant corals, showing fast growth uh, and 99% survival rate on the nursery. That is excluding the acropora we transplanted earlier. to implement similar projects for a five-star five -star resort in the Seychelles. And so we built a nursery for them and placed about 2,000 core fragments uh, within the APA, MPA close to the resort. And these fragments were taken from colonies that were experiencing exactly the same thing, survivors of leaching events, but invaded by Jubila. And I think it's worth saving this material, propagating it. Uh, finally, a crucial activity for us was to explore and identify resilient sites that would replenish degraded areas and be potential candidates as future donor sites. Trompeuse Reef, located a few kilometers southwest of Kuzan, is one of those sites displaying many large live colonies of branching, mounding, uh, and crusting species, and tablet as well. Um, further monitoring is needed on the site to determine whether the resilience due to um, oceanographic features, topographic features. Uh, one thing though we had to work on on this site, we were on the staff, had no time, but we did um, cut, uh, cull uh, some cuts from the sites that uh, the site was showing high numbers of crannous and starfish. So, we managed to uh, lethally inject 2000, uh, 217 with vinegar to keep the population at check uh, until full recovery. So my take home message uh, today is that coral restoration goes way beyond planting corals. It also involves keeping the dynamics of the reef at check. And after this experience, we were able to address reef recovery with an adapted strategy to bleaching in the context of restoration within an MPA. Among other things, we recommend target management in the year post-bleaching, propagate super corals, and control your predators. Until natural recovery, you can increase coral cover on your reef by refragmenting part of your nursery. 
uh, and assist natural recruitment. We have experience and we're back in Australia, uh, full of um, energy and uh, <laughs> experience to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Um, we're going to move on with uh, some experience of coral bleaching in the Maldives from Tess Moriarty. Good afternoon. Um, so this presentation um, is focusing on the uh, progress and accomplishments we have made through our reef restoration project. I'll just point out too that I was also in the team uh, doing the large-scale reef restoration work with Austin and Louise. We did the training workshop, so you'll see that's quite a similar nursery development as well for this uh, project that we did in the Maldives. Uh, we also have a, a poster presentation, which you can find out in the foyer, and we also have a lovely video presentation that the team have put together, which if you would like to see, I'll give you the details after the talk. Okay, so as we probably all sort of know, um, a lot of the coral reef, reef restoration work started out in the 1966, although, as Austin has pointed out as well, um, a lot of work hasn't been published. So this is most of the stuff that I've found that have been published. Um, so, and I'd also like to point out that on Monday I found out that a lot of the traditional owners of Australia were already growing corals back in the 1940s, which I found was an interesting fact. Um, so no, back in the 1960s, uh, coral restoration started by um, sort of grabbing whole coral colonies and moving them from a healthy site to a degraded and neutered, or denuded site. So it was quite a small scale um, uh, approach. Over the years, the techniques and technologies have advanced and we've been able to grow um, large-scale restoration projects around the world. There are now coral restoration projects developing uh, throughout the world. These projects are anything from small-scale in dive resorts to large-scale um, and outplanning thousands of corals a year um, and developed as business models. The research into coral restoration has also increased from a mere 31 uh, papers before the turn of the century to 778 in the last 18 years. So there's no hiding the fact that there's a lot of contention about the coral reef restoration work and it can become quite a heated debate. But our coral reefs are rapidly declining and their decline questions the very existence of thousands of communities that triggers us to take an active approach to reef conservation. So one such corner of the world, famous for its luxurious resorts, white sandy beaches, and rich in marine biodiversity, is the Maldives. So it's, the Republic of Maldives is an archipelago situated southwest of Sri Lanka, and it runs 800 kilometers long from north to south, consisting of 26 atolls and 1,190 coral caves and islands. The coral reefs are the Maldives' source of land, food, protection, and income and it's only sitting about one metre above, on average, above sea level. So it's exposed to um, climate change. The Maldives possesses extreme vulnerability to climate change. The sclerotinian corals of the Maldives have been exposed to disturbances for more than two centuries. Coral is not only the basis for which the Maldives is formed, but historically also what the Maldives used as founding blocks for their houses, uh, mosques and businesses. Oh, that was the one before. So as you can see the picture at the very end, that's some of their houses where um, they were used to farm the corals and physically make their houses from coral. So the exploitation of the reefs was not limited to coral mining, but began advancements and expansion of land reclamation practices, harbour construction and resort island development. Subsequent to the first Coral bleaching event in the Maldives in 1988 sparked the apprehensiveness for the future of the reefs. Since then, the Maldives has exposed, been exposed to another major coral bleaching event. And as a result, tourist resorts have responded with numerous techniques to rejuvenate their house reef. So Vela Private Island is situated in Nunu Atoll, which is north of the capital of Male. You can see it's in the yellow there. And they wanted to rejuvenate their house roof post the 2016 bleaching, as well as their island uh, resort construction. 
Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, so uh, post 2016 bleaching, the island found that we lost 100% of their tabula acropora species and about 90% of the whole acropora, acropora species alone. So the aims of the project were simple from the management perspective. Grow a reef fast that the tourists will enjoy and do it very, very fast. Okay, so grow a lot in a very small time. Um, we also had some other goals, I guess, we wanted to establish. In order to do this and for this project to be um, holistic and self-sustaining, we wanted to make a more holistic and realistic reef. So we wanted to have lots of different genre and look at different species. So it looks for something like we would have seen a couple of years ago. We also wanted to contribute to the literature and best practice for coral restoration projects in Maldives because there's a lot of boutique sort of restoration projects scattered throughout these resorts, islands, in the Maldives, but there was nothing in the literature that we could gain from this. So the timeline of the project, so at the, f at the first point we have our coral nursery construction, then we'll go out and get our coral fragments, then there's a nursery phase where the corals are in a, again, sort of like a five-star luxurious, you know, best conditions for the corals for 12 months. During this time, we monitor, the, monitor them for health, bleaching, survival, and so forth. And then we transplant them out onto the reef after they've been a minimum time, about 12 months within their nurseries. Oh, this might take a time because it's a video. Okay, so we have two types of nurseries. We call it the rope nursery and the net nursery. So the top diagram is the rope nursery. It's about 20 meters long by six meters wide. It's anchored at 30 meters at the bottom of the reef floor and a sandy patch. Uh, the net nursery is also anchored at the same area and floated at the same height, uh, but it's constructed of a netting material. The rope nursery is for the branching genera and then the net nursery was for all the other life growth forms. Uh, so we went out and grabbed our coral species. So we were also looking at corals of opportunity and also donor coral fragments as well. Um, you have to take, you have to remember that this was post 2016 bleaching. So we were working with what we had on hand. All right. So we took about 10% of donor coral colonies. So is that we didn't harm that uh, healthy species out on our reef. So we have a total of four nurseries. Um, the rope has between 2,500 to 3,500 coral fragments um, and the net nursery about 500 fragments. So this is just a picture of what they sort of look like. You have a diploastria here and then a lot of fossil opera over there on the right. So after stocking the nurseries, we had uh, 8,713 of fragments in our rope nursery. Um, covering five genera and 11 species, and our net nursery, 476 with 30, uh, 31 genera um, of 54 species. So a total of 9,189. Now what will you draw your attention is that there is uh, a lot more, uh, lot more biodiversity in the net nursery than there is our rope nursery. And that's just because after the bleaching event, there was uh, a lot more diversity in the um, sort of encrusting corals and massive corals than there was in our branching species throughout the Maldives. All right, so the survivorship. So how did these two nurseries compare to one another? So the green line is showing our net, uh, rope nursery, which is doing quite well considering. Um, what would uh, be contributed to the decline in the rope nursery, however, is that we had a bit of a disease outbreak of um, white syndrome, which is following on from our bleaching event then a really mild winter. All right, so that can contribute to a lot of the decline in that nursery. The net nursery, you can see it's looking a bit stark in the red there, and it's only down at 20, it's down to 28% survival rate. So for us, it wasn't looking too good for that sort of technique for where we were. Uh, um, as for growth, this is one of our rope nurseries after about 12 months. 
uh, showing a lot of Fossilophora because, again, that's what we had um, on our reef. And they're all doing really healthy. Just stop there. Okay, so for growth, uh, we have the net nursery on the left and our rope nursery on the right. And you can see at time point zero, so that's when we first put them in, the net nursery has a cable tie over it, and you can see at time four, the tissue of the coral um, has grown over that. But you see there's not much extension around that, as um, some of the others have already pointed out through in the microfragmentation, that if you have a larger piece of coral, it's, not, it's growing much slower than if you're microfragmenting. Um, then you'll see for the rope nursery, uh, time point zero, where the fragment was about eight centimetres big, it has grown into this nice 3D structure. Okay, so EVI, so we measured the corals on um, what we call EVI, so ecological volume increase. So we're looking at the height, width and length to have a more 3D structure of how the coral was growing rather than just linear. So you see again here the Pocilopera for the so rope nurseries are number one and number three, and the net nursery is the one in the middle. And these are just the ones that we sort of pulled to um, examine for the growth over time. So you can see the Pocilopera have also taken off, and as that's been also said earlier as well. Whereas the other species, um, the Acropora helioporum varieties, sort of spanned out or um, in some cases actually uh, died. So our Acropora didn't do so well in our uh, rope nursery, unfortunately. So, so far the results. So at the moment we have 2,136 colonies transplanted out onto the uh, reef after just um, 24 months. And the mo majority of this is Pacillopora, as I had said earlier. We have five, uh, four genera that we're um, monitoring and a 95.5% survival rate out on the reef at the moment. So we're pretty happy with that section. So this is just a visual diagram. So our plot, which literally had no corals left in it, and then uh, time point uh, two, where we've transplanted, oh, sorry. Then we've transplanted and the corals are there. And then further on, we have the corals looking nice and healthy on the reef. And again, yeah, they will grow over that cement within um, a couple of weeks. So the growth of the transplants, um, at this stage they've been growing quite steadily as opposed to when they were in, out in the nursery. I think they're acclimating still to the, the new site where they are. And they also have a bit of invasion of the parrotfish having a little bit of nibble here and there. So you can see that in a the picture there where the sim tops being taken off and the coral has grown back. Um, I've also got along here the health status. So we're monitoring between one to six. So six being dead and one being perfectly healthy and then increments about 25% of uh, co live coral coverage. Um, so you'll see a lot of them are in the healthy range with only about 4% um, in the, the dead um, or um, necrotic, necrotic range. Okay. All right, so what have we learned from this? the first of its kind. We had high uh, survival of Postalopera, but we found that the net nursery really wasn't working for us, as you could see from the results. So we need to go back to the drawing board for those uh, genre and life forms, uh, which we'll, I'll cover in the next slide. So, uh, yeah, so we we're, were pretty happy with how Postalopera was doing, and it'll be helpful to put that back onto the reef as um, they are the pioneering species, and we've got something there for the other species to be attracted to in the future. So future studies, so we've already started working on uh, different net nursery design. Now we want to put the coral onto a disc itself. Before we had the cable tie, which was, uh, we've proved to see there's a lot of biofouling, and also the cable tie was uh, sometimes, uh, sorry, um, it was a bit of a way off the live coral tissue, so it was another surface for biofouling to, um, to originate. So now we're putting uh, biofilament fishing line onto the corals, so it's smaller surface area and right against the coral tissue itself. Uh, we're thinking about a different nursery location. It's currently eight, uh, anchored at 30 metres, which can be quite difficult and challenging during uh, high current times. Um, there's strong currents in the Maldives, and so the nursery is sometimes moving down to 16 metres. 
We also want to introduce other invertebrates and stuff into our reef, so uh, giant clams, urchins, uh, soft corals and so forth, to make it a bit more holistic and realistic um, looking reef. And we want to monitor the cushioned sea star predation and the recruitment levels at our sites. So that's it, I just want to say thank you for everyone. It's been, um, it's a lot of hard work putting all those corals and looking after them. And we've learned a lot along the way and we've learned a lot from all the other people here and the, the big giants. Um, so we'll take that back to the drawing board and improve our project um, years to come. Thank you.